Good morning, everyone. How does code sound? Why is it important to know how code sounds? Well, I think the organizer's t-shirts have a really nice example of how, how code sounds. Can you stand up, Torsten? If you look at the logo, so I imagined it to mean I love functional programming, but apparently because they're the two brackets, they're of course function application. So you're supposed to read it as I apply functional programming. I didn't get that. I thought it was just a Lisp rendition of a hard sign, but <laughs> it, it means something. So that's, I think, a nice example already of if we don't agree upon how code sounds in your brain, then stuff can get weird and people can be confused. This is basically the entire summary of my talk right there on the t-shirts of the organizer. So that's pretty cool, I think. But I'll take you through a longer story of how I came to study how code sounds. And this starts with how people learn to program. That's, that's one of the things I started with. Who, who knows who said this? Everyone should learn how to program. Steve Jobs? <laughs> Me? True story. Well, I think it's every programmer ever, right? I mean, we all love programming and we all say, oh, you know, we love programming. So all the kids should learn programming because programming is awesome. And this, even though it's a, a, a very benign statement, leads to an interesting question. Because if we say everyone should know programming, that means we have an idea in our brains of what programming is. Because otherwise, how can you say everyone should learn programming? You, you have a definition of programming. And this leads then to the question, what is programming? It, it might not be the same for everyone. Some people might have radically different ideas about what programming is. And maybe we programmers aren't the best people to decide what programming is. I'm not sure if you know this story of three fish. I really love this story. There's this big fish and he's swimming and he sees two tiny fishies. So the big fish says, hey, folks, how's the water? And the tiny fish say, what's water? They don't know what water is because they're only have, they've only ever been in water. They have no conception of there is something like air and they are in water and they could be outside of water and it would be very uncomfortable for them. In a sense, I think this is how we programmers are in the water of programming. Because we only hang out with programmers, we only program all the time, maybe we're not the best people to answer the question of what programming is because we only know programming. So how did I get this insight? It's, it's an interesting story that starts even further back than my work on programming education. In 2008, I moved from Eindhoven, this is the tiny country of the Netherlands, I moved from Eindhoven where I did my master's degree to Delft where I started a PhD. And this is maybe a hundred kilometer move, but for people from a tiny country, that's a very big move. So I did a PhD project at TU Delft, and the goal of this project was to make a DSL, a domain-specific language for finance. That was the research goal of my PhD project. And we envisioned something like this, maybe a COBOL-like programming language where people could express, normal people, non-programmers, could express business rules in an executable way so that they could make their own tiny programs and not be so reliant on programmers. The first thing I did is I went to a Dutch insurance company to do an internship to figure out how do people do things there? What do they do and how could we make a domain-specific language to support them? This was more or less the world view that I had going into this company. I'm not sure if they still teach this in universities, but this is what they taught me when I studied. You have users and you have programmers. And there's a big wall between those two types of people users and programmers. And the programmers program and the users use. That's the, the definition and maybe sometimes they communicate a tiny bit, but by and large there are two different types of people. <coughs> so imagine my surprise when I figured out that all of these people were programming. I just went to that insurance company and I was like, wow, everyone is programming. The programmers are programming, but also the users, the normal people, the non-programmers are programming. But it wasn't in a programming language like this. It wasn't in a traditional textual language that those users were programming. They were programming in spreadsheets. All of them. So I went back to my supervisor. I said, friends, they don't need a DSL in finance. 
They have a DSL in finance. It's Excel. It's such a good language. They, whatever we're going to come up with in a PhD project is never going to be able to compete with spreadsheets because they are the best. And I say this really without any irony. Spreadsheets are the best programming language that has ever existed. See, I'm serious. I mean, spreadsheets are so intuitive. People, people programming in a spreadsheet, they don't even know they're programming. Like, imagine doing Java by accident. <laughs> like, hey, this thing Eclipse, it just showed up on my laptop. I clicked it and the user interface was so intuitive, I immediately knew what to do. No one ever. But this is how it works for a spreadsheet. You open it, you figure out how it works, and you can just start programming. How amazing is that? It's just, it's the best programming language. So that became the, the motto of my PhD dissertation. Spreadsheets are code. They are a functional reactive programming system. Because a spreadsheet, a for spreadsheet formula, can only access cells, but not change the value of other cells. So they're functional. They're purely functional. And they're also reactive because all the cells are updated based on needs of the system. Everything isn't refreshed. Only the cells are refreshed that need to be refreshed. So they're functional reactive programming, and still everyone can use them. So that might be a lesson there for Haskell. <laughs> so spreadsheets are code became the motto for my PhD thesis. And that was all super nice. And I went to conferences like this, conferences aimed at developers. I went there with my story saying, hey, spreadsheets are code. And then people be like, Oh, yeah, sorry. So I, I wrote a bunch of papers and then I graduated. Hooray. This was the story of the brain. So the part, it actually happened like this and this is what happened. So these things happened and then I graduated. But there was also the story of the heart that I was going to tell you about. How was I feeling during that project? Why did I start to think about what is real programming? So as I said, I went to conferences all around the world like this, giving talks, saying spreadsheets are code, and then people said, it's not real programming. And then I was like, yeah, but, 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 but wait, 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 wait. They're functional and they're reactive, they're really cool. And people would still say, they're not real programming. And initially, it's sort of fun to be the underdog. They're like, yeah, but your arguments and people laugh and it's fun. But it really makes you sad and it's very, very tiring to keep explaining to people that what you're doing is valuable. And I know there might be a few people in the audience that have a PhD. If you're doing a PhD, then you and your topic merge somewhat. So if people say things about your topic, it's, it's really hurtful. So after a while, I was just really sick of people saying, it's not real programming. I mean, why? why is it not real programming? Why are you the boss of programming? Why are we defining what programming is? It's sort of a, a weird thing, real programming. Is there also fake programming? What does it even mean it's real programming? And I mean, it really, it really wore me out. And I, I, after a while, I just really didn't want to work on this topic anymore because I was like, well, if it's not real, then maybe I'll just do something else with my life that is actually real. And it was only until later that I figured out that the world doesn't have to be like this. So in this stage, at the end of my PhD in 2012, I really thought that this is how adult people interact with each other. This is how professionals do. They just say, oh, whatever tool you're using is stupid because my tool is superior. I really thought this is a normal way of people interacting. Only until later, when I joined other communities, so in, in addition to being a professor, I am also a runner. And I joined a running group, and then I figured out, people can be nice to each other. <laughs> so I don't know if you know people that are run. Who's a runner in the audience? A bunch of people. So runners, we're the worst. We're like more evangelical than Jehovah's Witnesses. If I see you catching the bus running, I'll be like, oh, do you like running? Do you want to go for a race together? What's your personal record? Oh, you should run. It's running is fine. We try to make everyone into runners and no one hackles each other's stuff. No one says, oh, you have Adidas shoes. Those have security vulnerabilities. You shouldn't use them anymore. <laughs> no 
one says that. I have friends that are almost twice as quick as me and they still join me to races. They don't say things like, you're not a real runner. It blows your mind, right, that those people exist. And it's not just r running, it's also knitting. So I really like knitting and I knitted a lot when I was a teenager. Then I didn't knit for a while and I came back to knitting. Turned out my needles were really outdated because people used to use straight needles and now they use circular needles. Doesn't really matter how they work. So I went to this meetup with my old fashioned needles and all the people have different needles. I was like, oh shit, they're going to say you're not a real knitter. I was worried. <laughs> They didn't do this. They just said, oh, you know, we used to do it like this. Let me show you how these new needles work. But without any judgment or meanness, they were just trying to help, Pfft, right? <laughs> it's so weird. And only then I was realizing how, how toxic our community can be and how that real programming and better programming languages impacts how people feel. But, you know, back to 2012, I was still sad and I was supposed to work on spreadsheets more. I just graduated and I got an assistant professorship at TU Delft as well. And there in my research vision, in my job application, I said, oh, I'm going to do more spreadsheet stuff because it's really cool. And then they hired me, but I was feeling like this. So that was pretty shitty. I was like, oh shit, you know, I should do spreadsheet, but I don't really feel like it anymore. And then luckily this happened. By a total coincidence, I ran into a bunch of kids at a local community center in Rotterdam, where I live, and they said, we need a programming teacher for kids on Saturdays. We need someone to teach kids programming. Can you do that? So I was like, yeah, I can do that. I know programming, so I can probably teach it to children without any ex experience. I'll be fine. <laughs> So I thought at least, I mean, my research isn't going anywhere, but at least I'll do something useful and something good for the community by teaching kids. And then this interesting thing happened because I started th to think about how will I teach them. And then in my memory, I went back to when I was a 10 year old learning to program. H how did I do that? How did I learn to program? What can I take away from how I learned programming for teaching these kids? And in my memory, there wasn't really a teacher, which is, it's interesting. I didn't really have a memory of a programming lesson. So I didn't really know what to do because I didn't really know how does a programming lesson look like. So inadvertently, I sort of mimicked my own childhood experience, just gave kids some access to a programming language and have them figure it out. And of course, it's not just me. Lots of people from my generation, to say, have taught themselves programming to a certain extent. And that influences how we think about programming education. Mainly, we, we don't think about programming education because we, we never got any programming lessons. And you might think, yes, but of course we didn't have programming lessons because you know, no one know, knew programming in the 80s and the 90s. But this is actually another water of programming situation. It isn't necessarily the case that we should have learned without any tutors or supervisors. This really has to do with how people view the world of programming. Because if, imagine you ha you're car caring for a child and they're interested in something like the guitar or tennis. What do you do? They, they, you get, give them lessons for everything you can imagine your child to be interested in you give them lessons. No one expects a child, however talented they are, to be able to learn the violin by themselves, or the piano, or soccer, or the guitar. Why do we have this expectation about programming? It's really weird. And it's actually not that weird if you know a little bit about the history and philosophy of early programming education. If you look into that, then it starts to make some sense. So probably people know who this guy is, the creator of Logo. Papert, Papert yeah, Seymour Papert. He was a mathematician and he was one of the creators of Logo, a programming language meant for kids. This is, many people know this. However, what many people don't know, at least in our community, is that Papert studied with a very famous psychologist. One of the most influential psychologists of the previous century was one of the tutors of Papert, and he's Jean Piaget. Who's heard of Jean Piaget? Ah, that's not bad. Who knew that Papert studied with him? 
a bunch of people, like four. So this is, this is something that people don't really realize, that Papert came from a tradition of constructivism, and it really goes too far to talk about everything that constructivism is. You can read more on my website if you want to know more. But the basic idea of constructivism is that people construct their own knowledge. So it, it, they say it's impossible for me to give you knowledge. The only way you can construct knowledge is you construct it by yourself, and you do that by exploring the world around you. That's the, the very basic summary of constructivism. And this very much influenced Papert. He said about programming that it's like, if a child lives in France, they'll just learn French, naturally. And if you just expose kids to programming, they will pick up the concept, naturally. That's quite a specific vision on education, and it's different, as I said, from the violin and the piano and language and math. We there accept more rigor in explanation. So it's not a coincidence that our generation thought themselves programming. Oh yeah, Piaget has said about Papert that nobody understands his work better than Papert. So you can imagine that someone from that situation, influenced by constructivism, would just create a programming language and say, hey, you know, do it and you'll figure it out yourself. Someone that comes more from the tradition of thinking of everything should be taught might have envisioned something really different. Maybe they would have envisioned an interactive tutor on a computer. Even in the times of Logo, it would have been possible to create a system that explains programming rather than just a programming language. There's no reason why the first programming language should be a full programming language without any guidance. So there's definitely a belief system behind programming education, but because we're not really aware of that history, we think, ah, oh, you know, you just put a kid behind a computer and they'll learn programming. I mean, we were able to do it, so why wouldn't everyone? Which is weird, maybe. These things, so the history and also the lack of a collective memory of programming education leads to the fact that lots of people teach like this. So they say, here's a concept, I just explained you the basic concept, like a loop is repetition, and things like this aren't really taught. So I, at least, when I was teaching those kids on Saturday, I didn't say things like, it really, really matters where the colon goes. You should really take care of the brackets and the spaces in Python, because otherwise the computer will be confused and upset. We talk about concepts and we assume silently that people will figure out the syntax, that they will just get it. And turns out they don't. So I had <laughs> lots of kids in the class struggling with weird things to me. Why are you struggling with brackets? Why are you struggling with spaces? Why aren't you struggling with recursion or variables? I mean, why, why do the tiny things break you up? It's weird, because this is really this water of programming situation where I just, when I was that age, figured out the syntax by re reading syntax from a book. And they didn't, so it was weird. And I was like, why, why is this so hard? And then I met this amazing person, Andreas Stapik. He's a researcher in the US, and he's, he does amazing type of research. And I want to share something, because it gave me great insight. So he had 100 students from his university program in different programming language. These were novices, they hadn't really programmed a lot before. And he gave them the same programming exercise in different programming language because he wanted to understand what is the effect of a programming language. So he had exercises in traditional languages, Java, Perl, Python and Ruby, but also Quorum, which is a language that he designed to be good, and Randomo which is a language he didn't design to be good. It's a language, it is what you think it is. The keywords are random ASCII characters. <laughs> so just as a, a matter of comparison, he said, let's take this weird programming language where the keywords have no real meaning and throw it in the mix to see how people are doing. So Randomo didn't do great, <laughs> but it didn't do better than Java and Perl. <laughs> Quorum and Python and Ruby did better. So I'll put that on the slide so you can tweet this. Novice programmers don't do better in Java or Perl than in a ge randomly generated programming language. <laughs> I'll give you a minute to take a picture. Or let it sink in. Or both. 
This is how bad we are at making programming languages. And this was not in the 80s. This study was done five years ago. Because apparently no one thought, let's, you know, let's put these programming languages to the test. Let's see what actually works and what doesn't work. So this was pretty, <laughs> pretty cool, cool work to say. So the conclusion you can draw from that, apart from maybe we're not really good at making programming languages intuitive, is just syntax isn't intuitive. We need to teach syntax. We need to explain to children or other novice learners what the meaning of a symbol is because they, they will not pick it up. And even more so, sometimes keywords can just be really confusing and, and not helping. So that was what. I figured out I need to teach syntax. But the how was still missing. How am I going to teach syntax? How am I going to get kids to practice symbols? Because maybe it isn't necessarily very exciting to practice, and how do we do this? And this is when I ran into another amazing person, Alexandra West, at another conference in Paris. And she's not just amazing, she also has an art degree. So we ended up drinking in Paris. It was really nice, and having maybe some wine and crazy ideas. So, so she said, hey, what if we view code as an artwork? And she started talking about how artists review each other's things. And it's really different from a pull request or a code review. Apparently, if artists like poets or even, even painters review each other's work, then they just put the work in the middle and everyone reads it in, in a workshop format. And then all the people that are not the artist give feedback on the work, explain what it means to them and what, what it made them feel and what they like about it and what they hate about it. And the artist can't say anything just sits there listening to people interpreting their artwork. That's more brutal than a pull request, right? <laughs> you just sit there, you're like, no, but that's not what I meant. But you have to shut up and have to wait the whole round of the workshop. And I was like, oh, that, that would be so interesting if we would, if we would do that with code to, to talk about how does it make you feel and what, what were you thinking when you were reading it. And then we, would, we went even further, and observed the wine being drunk, we're like, oh, but what if we create code as artworks? Well, we can make cubistic code and brutalist code and rococo code. What, is, what would it even mean? This was really, it was a fun, great, great night. And this actually led to a workshop. So at BoosterConf, um, I did a workshop about this idea where we had code as artworks and art as code. I brought artworks for people to, to look at and to be inspired by the artworks to create code. And it was, it was really fun. The people that participated in the workshop really, really liked doing it. But they didn't really get as far as I wanted them to get. And that was probably because the first exercise, I thought, let's not start with paintings and visual art straight away. Let's first do make a poem, because a poem is art and it's very close to code because it's textual. So I had this, this is one of my slides. I just said, here is a piece of Python. If you want to make a poem, you have to count the syllables in this piece of code. But this is already interesting because this sign, it can be is or becomes or equals. And if you're making a poem, it matters how many syllables you have. So is and equals will lead to different types of poems for that choice. But I thought naively to say to the participants, just get started with the poems. It doesn't really matter which pronunciation you pick. You just pick one. Yeah, did that didn't really work. So the people were like, ah, oh, sure, we'll just take is. <laughs> No, we won't. <laughs> no, we'll take stores and then <laughs> lots of discussion ensued in these tiny groups. They were really, rather than making poems and making artworks, they were discussing how to pronounce code. What is, it, what is an open bracket? Do you say open bracket or do you say F takes N? Do you do it more semantically than syntactically? Half of the workshop was spent on people having these type of fights, not really being very productive in creating great poetry or other artworks, which was interesting. It was, for me, oops, it, for me it was saddening that I didn't really make progress, but it was a very interesting discussion. I was like, wow, we have no clue how to pronounce source code, but also it matters to people. 
because, because they were fighting, they were saying, no, you're doing it wrong. No, you're doing it wrong. So it matters, but we don't know how to do it. And that's sort of weird. If something matters, you would think that people would convey towards a standardized meaning. So now I'm really, really, really interested in the topic of learning to read and pronunciation. And I read this, the Oxford Handbook of Reading. And if you read this, you're like, wow, we programmers, we know nothing. People that study how to, how to learn reading, they know everything. From, from kids that are six months, they say, oh, they already start to understand this, and they do this, and then they go to that phase, and then they know this, and then they do this. They have this whole understanding of all the steps that a child, a, a, a child that's learning in a regular way, how they conceive language. And they know things like, first, when you're learning to read, you focus on letters. So if five, six, seven-year-olds are reading, it's like the ook. In Dutch, we call this hakken en plakken, all the letters. And we do this sign with it as well, the ook. And only then a kid can say book. This takes a while, and only then they can think of the meaning. Initially, if kids are learning to read, they can't read and comprehend at the same time. It's very cool if you ask a six-year-old to read something, they'll go like and then you ask, okay, so where is the cat? They don't know, because all of their cognitive load is spent on the letters. And only if they've automated the letters in their brain can they think of meaning. So if you transfer that to programming, you're like, wow, if kids are still spelling out the keywords, spending their cognitive energy on where the semicolon goes, where the bracket goes, maybe they don't have mental space to think about concepts, and maybe that's why they're struggling. And it's not just for kids. Sound, how things sound in your brain, also really matters for adults. And I'm a scientist, so let's do a science experiment right here. <coughs> If it's early, I'll make you participate so you can be more awake. So what we're going to do is we're going to read tiny sentences in silence, and when you reach the end of the silent sentence, you raise your hand. So it will be like this. There is a cat in the tree if you're at the end. Yes, good. But here's the thing. I'll show the sentences to you in two steps. So it'll be like this. Oh yeah, you raise your hand. There is a cat. And now you raise your hand when you're at the end. Got it? OK, there we go. Awesome. Ready for the next one? So something happened here, right? Because the word tear and tear has two pronunciations, and tear is maybe a bit more common than tear, the first thing you read is you did, I have a tear. And then only when the pants are revealed, you have to go back. So if you do this with people, even with adults, proficient readers of English, these type of sentences will take longer to read than sentences in which there is no change in pronunciation. And you can also compare it to sentences where there is a change in meaning, but not pronunciation. So you could also have the same with calf. Calf means uh, a part of your leg, but also a tiny cow. So you can have, I hurt my calf in the shed or in the gym. And there it changes meaning, but not pronunciation. And that goes quicker too than this variant. So this is the definitive proof, to say, in a sense, that people sub-vocalize is what it's called. They read aloud in their head. And if you mess with them, with that, then people get confused. So because this thing can mean two things, it takes you slower. So we know that when words sound ambiguous, comprehension suffers or reading time suffers. And from that, it's just a tiny step to when keywords sound ambiguous, does comprehension suffer as well? Because we know from, from the other study we did that people don't have a consistent model of how to pronounce source code, so probably they're secretly spending mental energy on how to read things, like you did with this sentence in natural language. If you're reading code, it's very, very likely to a certain extent that you sound it out in your brain. So if you don't do that in a consistent way, then maybe you're spending too much energy. 
So to go further on this topic, we asked 10 novices to read Python. So these are kids, they, um, high school age children, they have had about six months of programming education, so they're, they're pretty okay with Python, and we gave them some code snippets, and we just asked them, read this aloud. Assignment, read it aloud. They had a variety of suggestions. There was no consistent model, and this was very much like what we found in the workshop, but this workshop was just free format, and I didn't have any consent forms. It, didn't, it wasn't even a plan that that would be science. That was just a fun thing to do. So this was a proper experiment where we wrote down the background of the kids and tried to figure out what, how do they call things. So they didn't really have a good model. We also asked 22 professionals. They didn't do much better. They even had extra cool suggestions, like if you have the same variable in a code snippet twice, like x is 5 and then x is 7, some of them would say things like, for the second assignment, like reassign x. They would give extra meaning based upon the, the program that they already wrote or re read, so that's nice, but that's only adding to the confusion. So from this you can conclude that novices, but also expert programmers, don't have a consistent model of how to pronounce code. Some of them weren't even consistent among themselves. So they would say x is 5 in one code snippet and x equals 5 in another code snippet because it was a bigger snippet and more was going on, or they had forgotten what they did in a previous exercise and they wanted to go back to check what choice they made in the beginning. So it, it's interesting that people don't know, apparently. And it's even more interesting because the kids we asked were Dutch kids, because you know I live in the Netherlands and we have access to Dutch kids, not necessarily to kids from other backgrounds. And many interesting things happened from the native language that we didn't anticipate. So we, we anticipated the confusion, but we didn't anticipate this. So this letter, of course in English, is, is an I. That you, you say it like your I. But in Dutch, we don't pronounce this letter as I, we pronounce it as E. So 12 year olds, 13 year olds, for six, seven years, we've taught them this letter is E. And then in programming class, we observed the teacher mostly pronouncing it in an English way because it's surrounded with English words. So you would naturally say for I in range and not for E in range. It's a bit weird. So we say it as I in Thai, but you say it as E in Cree. We found kids that within one code snippet pronounced both. So they said for, uh, for E in range, print I. This is remarkable. You could wonder, it's hard to look into their tiny brains, even if the ethics board would let us. But you can wonder if they actually understand it to be the same variable if they pronounce it in a different way. If they're still spending energy deciding is this the normal E letter in Dutch or the I in English. That's where their cognitive load is going and not to understanding the code. Oh, there was one. Who, who is Dutch in the audience? Cool. I have a joke just for you. <laughs> so there was, there's the keyword while for a loop. One of the kids said that it would be pronounced wille. We said, no, it's wrong, you say while. He said, yeah, but wille, it makes sense because it goes round like a wheel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're still wrong, but it's very clever. <laughs> so the conclusion from this, I think, is we should tell kids, we should tell learners how to pronounce snippets of code so that they don't spend all their mental energy on figuring out how is this thing called. And we actually did this in a study where we did a controlled experiment. Half of the kids got a normal programming lesson. And in half of the group, we said, this is how the code sounds. We made them repeat it aloud as a group, like you would do the tables of multiplication. One times three is three. We said, x equals five. So we had them repeat for i in range, make it specific how to pronounce everything. <coughs> and we found, unsurprisingly, if you look at all other sorts of education, that this actually works. So the group that read code aloud every week versus the control group did way better on syntax than the group that didn't. And 
as I said, like with the tables of multiplication, how often have you practiced them aloud? I, I've done a similar lecture for elementary school teachers and they were all like, yes, of course, this is how you teach something. This is how we teach everything. We make kids repeat it aloud a billion times and then they know it. It's, it's not rocket science. So the conclusion, I think, of my talk is we should really agree on what I, the term I coined, a code phonology. Every programming language should make it explicit, this is how the keywords sound. This is how you say it, and probably there will be some controversy around this, because people won't agree, as I've s shown in my tiny experiments, but that's fine. We can discuss what's the best solution, or maybe just pick a random one and stick with that, because it will really very much help novice learners if, they don't, if they're not confused about how to say things. So, it doesn't matter for me, it doesn't matter what you pick, you can pick whatever, at least agree on something that makes sense. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be the same for novices and professionals. This is for ma mathematics education as well. If you're, if you're a young learner, for a minus symbol, lots of people have a simpler word initially. So in English, some people say instead of five minus three, to younger kids they say five take away three. And only at a higher age, they learn the word minus. So we could have a similar thing where for novices, maybe we spell out all the brackets and all the spaces and everything that matters and after a while you go to a more semantic representation. So as I said, this will be very, very useful for education, but there are other things where a code phonology can be super useful. For example, if you're pair programming. So if you're doing Python, for example, with a Java developer, you'd say, hey, okay, now you do a bracket. And they think of a bracket as a curly bracket because that's the thing in Java that makes more sense and then you actually mean a round bracket. So if you're pair programming, especially from people with different programming languages backgrounds, it's probably super useful if you know what all the symbols are called and if you agree how to call everything up front because then you don't get so confused. Another reason that a code phonology is going to be super, super useful is for people with disabilities. So if you're blind or, or you can't see very well, you usually consume source code with a screen reader. That's a tool that just reads natural language aloud. They aren't really meant for programming languages. So if you have something like this, it would read def underscore underscore init underscore underscore, rather than just say constructor or init or initialization. That's really very tiring. And this is not even the worst, because if you have something like this, a property, it would say Harry, then it will pause because there's a dot, a period, but it is a pause in normal language, and then it would say name, which is, it makes total sense in natural language that a period is skipped, it doesn't really make sense in programming. So if we agree what all the symbols are called, we could put that in an IDE plugin, and then people that can read or people that can type have a way easier way of interacting with source code, and that would be very nice. That's it, that's everything I wanted to share with you. Let me just summarize my entire talk in, let's say, one minute for the people that came in late or they're still hungover from yesterday night. So I talked about how does code sound? How do we hear code if we're reading it? And this goes back to a, a theory of programming that I've been thinking about a very long time, the water of programming. What do we believe about programming and why do we believe it? And it, I think it's a very interesting takeaway message if you go home after this conference to try to recognize, hey, is this really the case or is this a water of programming situation where I should just step back and try to see other perspectives. Another takeaway message, don't be these people. I'm serious, don't be these people. Don't say you're not programming. That's not real programming. If someone comes up to you and says, I'm a programmer, believe them. They know what they're doing. If you're, if you're running a meetup and someone comes to your meetup and says, hello, I program VB6. You'll say, you're welcome, sir. Thank you for joining this meetup. That's an awesome programming language. Show us what you can do. Don't go not real programming on people. It's stupid, I mean. 
this water of programming isn't limited to the things we believe about adult programming and how a programming profession looks like. It's also very much in how we see programming education. We have a certain philosophy coming from Piaget that we're not really aware that that's our philosophy, but it happened and we all believe now that you can teach yourself programming without any guidance, which, as I said, if you look at the violin, for example, is actually a very weird way of thinking of education. What we have tried to explore is can we help kids learn syntax by vocalizing because if you let people, kids, do it naturally, they're not really consistent. And especially if you're talking about kids that are learning programming in a second language, which most kids are, probably, are in English as their first language, then you get this extra burden of understanding source code in your own language or in English and the mix between that. So that's an extra reason why we're interested in it. And we figured out that if you practice reading source code aloud, you get a better understanding of syntax. So we should just all agree on a code phonology, how does code sound to make it easier for kids. The end, I'm at Felina, you can read more, all my research paper are open access, available on my website, felina.com. People ask me, how do you make these slides? I make them with an app called GoodNotes on the iPad, it's really very cool, so if you want to draw, they're not paying me for this, if you want to draw your slides, this is definitely a very cool app to explore. If you like listening to me, I have a podcast as well. It's called SE Radio, Software Engineering Radio, where we interview people from the software engineering field. We have two or three episodes a month. So if you want to listen to more about software engineering, that's it. And thank you to all the cool people involved in this research. The end. have someone for questions? There's someone with a mic somewhere. Many questions. Let's, I think he was first. Hi, thank you. Um, more remarks than questions. There are two remarks that tie into each other. Uh, I had the good fortune to uh, uh, work with this uh, oddball uh, language called Forth, which has a famous book coming with it uh, by Mr. Leo Brody. It was called Starting Forth. Uh, for all the fourth uh, concepts and the words and the squigglies, he had an exact pronunciation with them. Uh, so that helped me a lot to pronounce code in my head. Exactly what you say, it helps with conceptualizing what you're reading and also talking to yourself with a lot of people do in their head and stuff like that. What also falls out from that is that those things had a, a, a pronunciation that was based on semantics, you know, a bigger than and then the letter R would be pronounced as 2R because some data was moved. So I think you cannot go for a universal uh, pronunciation of language, because then you really get down to what you already do, like underscore, 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 without getting any meaning from that. So I don't expect a universal IDE plugin. I also think that uh, uh, getting towards a pronunciation is just somebody has to publish it. You just have to be popular, yeah. say, this is how you pronounce Ruby, this is how you pronounce yeah. uh, 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 yeah, whatever. Pascal, yeah, I, I, I don't, don't envision one pronunciation for all the programming language. I think it will be something like a, a style guideline where Python makes different choices about how to write variables than C. That's probably fine, but it will be per programming language. Before we have any more questions, I, I have a friend, he's called Peter Hilton. He has amazing rule for Q&A that I'd like to share and abide by from now. There are two rules for asking questions. The first rule is the first sentence should be a question, and the second rule is there's no second Sentence. <laughs> so questions are good, but please make them questions. People are still daring to ask something. Oh. Uh. Uh, can I? Oh, yeah. oh. You go first. oh cheers. Uh, interesting talk. How do you get around the problem of uh, dictionaries between different areas and also culture? Like, I get the idea you're proposing. Sorry, I'm doing a second sentence. I get the idea you're proposing. Um, like one standard to rule them all? Like how, how do you get around that? Because, you know, culture is everywhere, so. Yeah, so do you mean culture of countries or culture of programming languages? Well, like with, with culture, you're gonna get different meanings and also with different, you know, fields, you're gonna have different meanings for different words. And they might use Python, 
but they might mean different things. Yeah, and there's a very good remark where maybe in some parts of Python, let's say pandas, you would use different formulation than in Django because the domains are so different. Yeah, I can imagine that happening. So, um, another question. <coughs> I'm here. <laughs> so, uh, in the experiment where you uh, let uh, students read loud code and then uh, compare how they performed on syntax, how did you evaluate how they performed on syntax? Yeah, so we had programming quizzes where they had to select the right answer from a bunch of options. But the, there are standardized measurement techniques that we have used also in other experiments. So measuring what kids or other novices know about program, programming, there are tests you can use that other scientists have also used. But basically quizzes. Hello? <laughs> Andrea <laughs> from TomTom, Tom, uh, self thought programmer. Um, can you please go back one slide? I have a specific question. Go back one slide? One slide only, yes. So from the, oh, <laughs> one slide, that's, that's how, box. How much further? That's this it, one. thank you, that's it. Okay. So considering the, uh, second, the, the first one on the second row for I in range three, whatever it is. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, you, to you told us that uh, there is, uh, uh, there are some difficulties for people, even uh, considering the I that some culture like mine pronunciate uh, E. So um, did you uh, consider how much important it is to teach people that to not write for I in range three because that I is not actually telling the programmer anything? So the question is, it's, it's somewhat about the pronunciation and the, I, I agree with what you say, but uh, we also have to consider that when we write code, we have to write code in such a way that we, put, we should put ourselves in an easier position to read the code afterwards. For example, in this case, that I doesn't really tell me anything about the code. Yeah, so we've done other experiments, not this experiment, where we have explored with children how do code smells affect their uh, programming, and it's, it's not very well. So it's definitely a good idea to teach kids about code smells. However, they should also understand how to pronounce this because they will see this in they they go on stack overflow the first for loop they see is for i so even though we teach them not to do it we can shield them from bad code everywhere else there's a question here two hey, um how do you suggest to deal with the fact that uh, the majority of the uh, program is actually uh, not operators but words in the english language mostly which are also quite hard to pronounce, for, especially for non-English or non-Latin uh, kids. Like what, what, yeah, how do so you deal with that? Key keywords are an issue too. Well, probably a very good idea is to take all the, if you're a pro programming educator, take all the keywords from a programming language and even before you start opening an IDE, talk about all the words, how to pronounce them, what do they mean, and only then program. I think that makes total sense. A keywords, maybe you've never considered this, but a keyword like for, is a remarkable bad choice because four also means four. And if kids read four, then maybe the first thing that goes in their brain is the, the number four. So talking about what those words mean and how to pronounce them is a very good idea. I myself pronounced array like array until I went to university because I got it from a book and no one told me how to say it. I just wanted to clarify okay. that I meant the words like uh, in the libraries, like names of the methods, they also need to be pronounced, right? And uh, do you imagine to, uh, giving kids uh, spelling clues? For, because there are so many of them in any given programming language. Yeah, so you could try to scaffold your lessons where every time you talk about a new concept, you talk about the word as well. It's, it conflicts, of course, with this more exploratory view of programming education, but it's definitely a good idea. And I imagine that, but this is just hypothesizing here, that if you start with explaining words and their, their pronunciations and their meaning, after a while, if kids encounter new words, maybe the first question that they will ask is, yeah, but what does this word mean and how do you pronounce it? Simon here has had a question for a while, so I want to give him the opportunity to ask something. I very seldom read my code to anybody else. So, and this is all part of the same sentence, notwithstanding that this might be important in the classroom, is it actually important for us all to agree on a common phonology? So, probably, so yes. 
probably, <laughs> probably yes, if, we, if we teach kids, uh, then this will go to, into the workforce at one point. But I, even though you don't read it to, to other people, I imagine, like I showed with the tear, tear sentence, that even, even an expert programmer like yourself, to a certain extent, will sub-focalize code. Maybe at a very high level, but still you'll do it in some sense. It's consistent for me. Yeah. It doesn't have to be consistent for everyone. Yes, Th this is probably true. So I can totally imagine, like also with reading natural language, that some people do it way quicker than other people. They only vocalize a few words or they practice not stop vocalizing at all, but still at one point you were taught how all the letters, how you write them, how you pronounce all the wicked stuff you have in English, you were taught that and you take, <laughs> you take that with you your entire life. So even if you get more efficient parts of it, you still use. You still use the part of your brain that reads all the letters. So many more questions. Uh, I have a small question. Um, have you considered uh, uh, how does the, uh, the difficulty of the words used in, um, say, in a library to describe something? I'm thinking, for example, of uh, like iterates, which is a functional programming concept that I frankly have difficulty understanding because I always get confused when, the, when it's being described, iterator, iterate, and I get it, it, it's a passive form. Passive forms are difficult to understand. So how does naming uh, in, in programming influence understanding of what, what the, the, the code does? Or what, and have, you, have you looked into it? And have you yeah, seen so o only feedback? a little bit, but this is a whole area of cognitive psychology that is called uh, re relative linguistic, relative ling something with relative and linguistics, where they try to study if the natural language that a person speaks influences their perception of the world. And people didn't believe it for a very long time, but now people start to agree that the natural language that you speak to a certain extent does influence how you observe the world around you. So it's very likely that this is the case with keywords as well. But I didn't study it to answer your question. <laughs> oh, I, I can select. Oh, that guy, all the way over there. <laughs> Hi. Uh, initially, you talked a bit uh, about how hard the languages like Java are for, for kids or for novice users. I'm wondering, are there any features of a certain programming language that make it more comprehensible for the beginning users? Yeah, so as you saw in the experiment, the Ruby and, and Python did better than other programming languages. It's of course hard to say exactly what is the reason for that, but those are programming languages that from their culture emphasize readability. So probably thinking about readability is a good way to actually be readable. And there might, might be a trade-off between a readable programming language and an effective programming language if you're a, a professional. So it might be the case that there's some tension between a readable language and a language that's more powerful. But I don't know. Uh, you. What does white space sound like? <laughs> this is a good question. Actually, in the Python exercises, we had the kids also read the white space for loops. Because in Python, it matters. So if it matters, you should say it. So in these exercises, we said 4i in range, open bracket, 3, close bracket, colon, space, space, print, open bracket. Be but I would say you only vocalize it if it matters. If you have a non-white space sensitive language, maybe you don't want to read it. Although, going back to what someone there said, if you want to teach them about good, well-structured code, maybe even in a language that's not sensitive to white space, you will want to read it so that they practice in the loop you do it. But those are the details. It seems to me with every answer, more questions occur. <laughs> it's fine by me, but also I would like coffee. So let's limit it to, let's say, three more questions. I'll be around all day. So if you want to chat with me, uh, that, that it's possible as well. I don't know who had their hand up the longest. Um, oh, please use the mic so everyone can hear you also on the live stream, if, if people are watching the live stream. Uh, you made the comparison between like learning programming by yourself and learning a musical instrument by yourself, and some people are able to teach themselves how to play a musical instrument, and I was wondering if, do you think that 
And I also feel like learning programming, if I were sitting in a classroom compared to just sitting by myself and messing around on the computer, it's much more appealing to just sit around and mess around by myself. And do you think maybe it's like a different learning style where some people prefer to learn by themselves and others prefer to read it out loud or? Yeah, so there are actually two questions, but they're both really interesting. Okay. So I'll answer the both of them. So this thing about learning styles, people say, oh, there are different learning styles. This is a myth. There are no learning styles. And this, there's extensive evidence, read about it on my website if you want, that just explaining stuff to people is superior over exploratory learning. And there are other communities, not just the programming community, that really embrace this, oh, if, if it comes natural for kids, then they will like it better. And science says no. So that's question two. Question one, yes, there are people that can teach themselves a musical instrument. You're thinking of Jimi Hendrix, probably, because you know, he's known for that. But the fact that one person exists that can do it doesn't mean it's the best way to learn it. Maybe Jimi Hendrix would, be, would have been even better if he had learned to write music. We don't know that. So there's no reason to say, oh, just because one person can do it, it's a good way. I mean, there are people that le learn, teach themselves to read the alphabet. But still, we don't accept that, oh, they can do it and other people can. No, we put everyone to schools because everyone should be able to read. If we believe the same things about programming, then we should teach it in a superior way. I think that was a nice last question. If you have other questions, <laughs> ambush me after I had a coffee.